All right. <clears throat> Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for your word. Thank you for this time to preach your word again. I pray you bless me and help me to preach with all boldness and with uh, clarity so that we can understand and take heed to your word, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. We're going to look there, focus there at the end. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, the Bible says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. The title of my sermon this morning is Adam's Belly Button. Adam's... <laughs> Adam's belly button. So a belly button, for those that don't know, is a navel, right? Is uh, where the umbilical cord was attached in the womb. So did Adam have a de belly button? Open to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Clearly, that is a foolish question, right? And there is such thing as a foolish question. Don't, don't believe people that, oh, there's nothing as, like a foolish question. Just ask all your questions. You hear that in many worldly settings. Oh, just ask any question is good. Just ask any question. There's no foolish question. The only foolish question is a question that is not asked. Who has heard that before? Okay. All right. So, no. There are foolish questions, right? And unlearned questions. So, uh, but foolish questions, though, they pique the interest of the flesh, don't they? I mean, you're like, wow, Adam's belly button. I want to find out. You know, you just, you're just, it's so interesting to find out. And that is the thing about foolish questions. So there are three areas where dealing with foolish questions is addressed in the Bible and um, that I want to focus on. So let's look at the first one. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1. I'll read from verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly education fine which is in faith so do now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned from which some having sweared, swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm so one of the first things Paul writes in his letter to Timothy one in him is about foolish questions, right? Foolish things, vain janglings, and understand this, we're all servants of God. This is not just for the pastors, right? We should give the same heed to this warning that we should not get entangled in all these things. So fables, so he said fables, endless genealogies. I want to focus on those two. So fables are non-fictional stories or myths that teach morals. Now, the morals that they teach are morals of that culture. So many cultures have different fables and they teach their own morals. So they are non uh, or they are non-fiction, that means they are not real, they are not real stories anyway, just made up stories to teach the morals of a particular culture. Some good, some bad, right? And some evil. So ironically, the Bible in some cultures and religions is believed as a fable. They look at Genesis and they're like, oh wow, you see the what is Genesis teaching you? You know, they, they treat it as a fable. It's not real to, to some people. And, it, oh yeah, the snake talking, oh, of course that's not real. You know, a serpent cannot talk. So it's just a story to teach morals that you should be good and you should not disobey. If not, you die, that kind of thing. So they teach the Bible as a fable and they take fables over the word of God and use the, the morals from re actual fables over the word of God. And because they're teaching the Bible as a fable, you know, the Bible is just another subject in school. And they teach that in public schools, even in colleges. People have a degree on teaching Bible studies or religious studies. And therefore, Satanists too, they come up with their own fables and say, okay, yeah, we want to teach in schools also. And they'll be allowed it. So the Bible has been degraded to just another fable and another story just to teach morals. Now, this does not mean campfire stories are sinful. Don't get me wrong. Just don't teach them as the word of God. Don't make them equal to the Bible stories and say, okay, the lessons that you get from this story about tortoise or the hare or all the other animals or different things is the same as we get from the Bible. Just understand that it's, it's entertainment. Open, Matthew chapter 15, open to 2 Peter chapter 1. But Matthew 15 verse 9, Jesus said, 
but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So the, the fables passed down, the, the morals that have been passed down from, from their, their rabbis and their elders and their priests, not the ones that Moses got from the, uh, from the, at the Mount Sinai, but the ones that their 70 elders passed down. That's what they're teaching for doctrine. Oh, you cannot eat without washing your hands and all of that. So these are stories passed down from men and they're teaching them. And Paul is warning Timothy, don't get entangled in fables. Right? Don't listen to fables. They only gender, uh, 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 they only bring questions that gender strife, right? And what questions are those? Foolish questions, right? Oh, Adam's belly button, for example. So uh, we should be concerned with the written word of God. What does the word of God say? Use that as a litmus test for anything that is called morals. Morals is only from God, actual morals. That is what, what is right and what is wrong. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, the Bible says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. So we have a sure, a more sure word of prophecy, right? Not just what people said. Even Peter that is saying what happened about the transfiguration, he's saying, hey, you don't have to listen to that. You have a more sure word of prophecy, the word that is written down, that God says, okay, write this down. I want to give this, you know, to generations. This is my word I want written down. That is what we should take heed unto. That's what the Bible says. As a light that shineth in a dark place, right? So the light, this is a dark world. Jesus is the light. The light was the life of men. So that light in us, we should listen to it, uh, or that's the word of God, we should listen to it. It is, the, it is spirit and life, right? Until the day dawn and the day start arise in our heart. You know, we see in part, so yeah, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when all that is done at the end, we'll see Jesus as he is. We'll see like our, a reflection in the mirror, clearly. So verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So no one can say, oh yeah, this, I got this from the Bible and no one else got it from the Bible. Only you. You make up a fable or you make up a story from the Bible and you interpret it and say, oh yeah, this is just my interpretation. No. The Holy Spirit is the one teaching us. Somebody else had, would, would see it that way or have already seen it that way and thought it that way, even if you're not aware of it, unless it is wrong. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when something new comes up, when a fable, something very interesting, speaking the interest of your flesh, you just want to find out, oh yeah, so I'll tell you what happened in Mars, you know, the stars came together, you know, it's like, wow, so you're listening. Now, that's just a fable when people come up with that. Sadly, we have people seeking for fables. People come to church and they are seeking for fables. In fact, I was drawn into that before I got saved. Uh, Pastor Charles Lawson or so, whether it's pastor or doctor, I don't know. But he, I mean, just fables upon fables, so interesting. Just stories that cannot be verified by the more sure word of prophecy that we have and just makes up stuff. So they believe whatever suits them. So they pick fables, you know, from the stories, they can make morals of their own and take it as over the word of God. So be careful about People that preach fables and just making up their own morals. And here is how you know those that are seeking for fables. What do they say? Oh, that is your own interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should not have works, lest any man should boast. Um, that's how you interpret it. Like, how else <laughs> would you interpret not of works? Right? How else do you interpret the Bible? It's so clear, so easy to understand. There's only one interpretation, and that's the truth. Right? <laughs> but they come up with their own interpretation because they want fables. Another story somebody has told them. Um, I heard this sometime. I was listening to a sermon. He said, you can lose your salvation because so if salvation is a gift. It's not that, oh, because of sin you lost it. It's because you can give it away. For example, somebody gives you a, a car, right? Someone gives you a car. This is a fable, right? Somebody gives you a car and you use the car after like five years, seven years. You know, the car is getting old. You want a new car. So you take the keys and you say, hey, you need a car? There you go, you throw the keys, and as the person takes the keys, that's how you give away your salvation. You know, it kind of makes sense, right? You're thinking, yeah, 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 you can give away a gift. But that's not how it works. That's just a fable somebody made up so that they can teach a wrong gospel, a wrong, uh, false doctrine. So there's only one way to interpret the Bible, and that is the truth. <laughs> 
So let's look at endless genealogies. This is Zionism. Open to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 verse 22. Galatians 3 22. So Zionism is that the Jews in the flesh are superior to the Gentiles or to every other nation. The Jews in the flesh, superior to the Gentiles, the Greeks, everybody else. And furthermore, they have rights to the land. I mean, once you're born of Abraham's seed, <laughs> like physically, and you don't even have to prove it, you just have to say it. Or you can just pierce your flesh a little bit, a little blood comes out, then you'll be circumcised. So <laughs> you can now say, oh, that is my land. Anybody out there should be killed. You know, you own that land because the Bible says you own the land. But they don't actually follow the Bible or believe the Bible. It's, it's very interesting, Zionism. Uh, what people want to believe, the stories they make up, and they're like, oh yeah, we're more superior. And that is endless genealogy. That's what it was pointing to. Yes, the Jews or Israel had an advantage over other nations of the world. What was that advantage? They, had, they were given the oracles of God. But they were not superior human beings. I mean, we all came from Noah, for crying out loud. We have the same blood. Uh, the same blood runs through our veins. And so... Believers, Old Testament, New Testament, still have the same old flesh, right? So they're all the same, but in uh, uh, Old Testament and New Testament believers, all the same. So whether you say uh, Jews, Old Testament, or Israelites, Old Testament, that were saved, oh, they are more superior than... No, they are not. It's still the same flesh, the same sin, that uh, sinful flesh that we had, that we all have. So in Christ, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Bible says. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the scripture had concluded all under sin. So everyone is under sin, not just the uh, Gentiles, but the Jews also. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. He came unto his own and his own received him none. But to as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God. Right? So it's as many that received him, as many that came to him, that believed, then they are children of God. Verse 23 but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And that was the advantage that the Israelites had. And it should have been easier for them to believe on Jesus, but the devil did his work on them. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in Christ and if ye be Christ then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise open to Galatians 3 uh, sorry Colossians 3 9 Colossians 3 9 so clearly says there then you are Abraham's seed so and the genealogy is oh so what tribe did you come from are you actually Abraham's seed where are you from let's find out so we can place you in church where you know what rank you have if you can be a priest or if you can lead they're following the um, things that have passed away. Yes, in the Old Testament, uh, they had to be of a tribe, and Levi were the only priests, you know, things like that. But those have passed away because in Christ, we're all the same. There's no male or female. There's no Jew or Greek. There's no bond or free. I mean, we're all one in Christ. And then Abraham's seed. In Colossians 3 verse 9, the Bible says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. So we have put on the new man, we've put on Christ, we've baptized into Christ, so we're all the same. Verse 11, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision, non-circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now you say, okay, yeah, we don't care about uh, Israel uh, genealogies, which tribe they came from. But this also manifests in other forms. For example, in the church, people might say, okay, so who got you saved? Right? How did you get saved? So who got you saved? Oh, I was saved by this pastor. I was saved by Paul. I was saved by Apollos. You know? So, you know, they are finding, oh, yeah, so which line did you come from? Basically, it's kind of like an endless genealogy that is crypt is, is being is coming into the church in a different way. Uh, or who baptized you? You know, they're checking is the guy now reprobate? You know, the guy that baptized you? No. <laughs> so it's what line did you come from? That's what people are looking at. Or even for them, who are you listening to? 
So which pastor are you listening to on YouTube, right? I'm listening to Paul. I mean, did you see his sermon last, last Sunday? Or did you, see, you know, like, following one or the other and saying, oh yeah, I'm better off because I've listened to this. So be careful about being for Paul, being for Apollos. That is still the endless genealogy creeping into the church. So how about this question? What have you learned from your own Bible study? You know, talk about that. Yeah. E encourage the brethren. Edify one another. What you have learned. Not necessarily, oh, who got you saved? Who got you baptized? Wh what sermon? Oh, I, I heard that sermon. Oh, that was a great sermon. What did you learn? Just talk about what you learned. How you can help everybody else. Amen? Amen? Paul is telling Timothy, do not allow the teaching of fables. Endless genealogies. Because they bring about foolish questions. That's what they bring about. Oh, so uh, if this guy that baptized you, this happened to him. So does that mean, are you still saved? <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? I believe. I confess. I'm saved. Oh, but you said he saved you, so he's reprobate. And now you can see what he's saying. So do you believe that? So it's just foolish questions that come about because of endless genealogies, because of fables, because of what people are talking about. So, and these foolish questions, their answers are not rooted in the word of God. So, you're kind of left hanging to just say something that is out of the flesh. And therefore, it is not edifying. And I've said this, it's not only for the preacher behind the pulpit, but in our discussions in between services, right? When you're discussing with the brethren, don't, don't get entangled with endless genealogies and with fables. Let's look at the next one, 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we're still in Timothy. Look at the end of 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll read from verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 6, from verse 1. The Bible says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefits. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strive, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So foolish questions do not come from the wholesome words of God. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. You know, God has given us the Holy Spirit, our comforter, He's our teacher. He teaches us all things. And the Bible says, if you like wisdom, ask God and give it liberally and upbraid it not. He'll give us wisdom. And in Proverbs 4, 7, the Bible says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Because we need understanding. Remember, it was foolish questions, foolish and unlearned questions. That means you don't have understanding and you're asking questions. Reminds me, in school, especially um, I think it was cal calculus 3 and teacher will finish and he, he was so fast no one understood anything it's just that one guy that understands right but no one understood anything <laughs> and after he finishes teaching he's like any questions we're well, like we don't even know how to ask a question because it's to be unlearned it's like can you start again then that one guy you would be like so if X is like what is he talking about <laughs> you have no idea so online questions they don't understand no wisdom you don't know what's going on and you're asking a question it just shows how foolish you are right so no one wants to talk because no one wants to be foolish then everybody will look at the smart then the quiz will come out and it's like wow you guys don't know anything <laughs> anyway that's my point if you need wisdom ask you know so you don't uh, ask a question uh, a foolish question or an unlearned question so in context here, Paul is teaching about laboring to make a living to the glory of God, right? So not laboring to be rich and not oppressing those that are in lower estate. So those that are serving masters that are, you know, saved, are believers. Hey, labor well and serve your masters well as unto the Lord. And the masters too should be careful how they treat the, younger, uh, the ones of lower estate, their, their employees, because, you know, they have a master, which is Jesus Christ. So, but anyone that does not want to listen to this teacher, right that person is as the bible says doting about questions and strives of what he's proud knowing nothing so he doesn't know anything uh 
So, but those seven mammon will not receive that kind of teaching. To them, gain is godliness. So, uh, because the love of money is the root of all evil, as the Bible, te as the Bible teaches. So, it's pointing to all that, that is in this world. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's what they want. And all these things is what the devil used to tempt Jesus. So foolish questions are from the same desire to please the flesh. Not from wholesome words of God, but you just want to please the flesh. So you, you question the wholesome doctrines, the, the, uh, the word of God. Fables, you choose the morals you want to believe in, right? Endless genealogies is, I'm better than you. You're trying to please the flesh, you're comparing yourselves among yourselves, which is not wise. And here, laboring for your own glory. Oh, I just want to walk for my own glory, I want my own money. I, yeah. For example, uh, why is it uh, employee, employees working for believers who say, oh, so why isn't the boss giving us more money? You know, while working hard, what, he likes money? Doesn't he know money is the root of all evil? The love of money is the root of all evil? Why, why is he not paying us more? Right? So murmuring because you just want more money. or. Why is the boss not providing a Bible reading time during work? I mean, I thought he was a believer. <laughs> we should, during break time, there should be like a devotional time, Bible reading, you know, our own personal time. Yeah. Start questioning, just foolish questions coming up. Why? Because you want to be lazy? Because you want to work for your own glory? Or why is he favoring the unbelievers more than us? Maybe it's because the unbelievers are working more. That's why they're getting uh, um, promotions and getting pay rises or uh, what do you call it again? Inc pay. Anyway, that's why they are increasing their salary. <laughs> so why? You work hard. You work as unto the Lord and walk to the glory of God and don't take advantage of believers, whether it's in lower estate or whether it's your boss. In Titus chapter 3, open to Titus chapter 3 verse 4. Titus chapter 3 verse 4, the Bible says, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness. So this is the third one, actually. I'll start again. Titus 3 verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So, as believers, our focus, our main focus in life is the Great Commission. That is our main focus. Every other thing is to help us to do the Great Commission. <laughs> and the Great Commission is the, is, the, is the call of a church, basically. This is not just a, a one church's vision. It should be the vision of every church to accomplish the Great Commission. Go and win souls, baptize, and make disciples. You know, rinse and repeat. You know, we keep growing in the Lord so we can be better soul winners, so that we can train other people, edify other people, uh, make people disciples, and win more souls, and win more souls. That is, the, that, that is why we're here on earth. So, salvation by grace through faith, not of works and good works to maintain good works so why are we doing good works for the reward it's not a gift so it's to please god also anything outside the great commission that is not adding to the great commission is unprofitable and vain that's what the bible says you know vanity of vanity said the preacher all is vanity he had seen all that he had done all that and he's like he just looks around it's like you get old it's better to serve God in your youth. When you're old, you can't serve God anymore. It's all vanity. Vanity of vanity. See how the preacher all is vanity. So don't build on the foundation with only wood, hay, and stubble. Now, when you're building, you need wood, hay, and stubble. Don't get me wrong. And the Bible understands that. You need wood, hay, and stubble. You know, you put the window, you put the shim there to make sure it's level, right? So you need all that. But 
you, you should have a window. You can't just have wood here and stubble, right? <laughs> like you, you need this, the materials there. And if you build the only wood here and stubble, it's all going to be gone. Everything will be burnt up, right? So dwelling in foolish questions, when you dwell in foolish questions, you'll be trying to find an answer to the foolish question. Because you're not focusing on the Great Commission. You're focusing on thing, other things. And then you start dwelling in foolish questions. And you start looking for an answer which is not profitable. Which is not in the Bible. Because you have to come up with, oh, okay, but if you look at how this story went. And that story went. And you come up with your own. Because you're not focused on what the Bible wants us to be focused on. Open to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. For example, are there more than two genders? If you're trying to answer that question... <laughs> You're just wasting your time. I mean, it, it, remember, after the first admonition and the second admonition, reject. You should just tell them simply, male and female, created he them. <laughs> That's all. What else do you need? You know? Or you, you start, was Will Smith right? You know? <laughs> or was Chris wrong, uh, Rock wrong? Or should he have? You know, let's discuss what, what should have happened. So as he was stepping forward, why did he put his head forward? You know, like, <laughs> did, you know, just waste your time. <laughs> Discussing what happened. You know, it was this right. See, there are more important things in life. Like what is happening in the White House, in fact. You know, and people are just, dis um, just distracted by, I didn't even know the thing was going on until you heard about the slap. So what's that thing called? The, sh the award show. So um, it, it's just like asking this question, should sodomites get married? Like homosexuals, should gay people, should they get married? And that's, you know how the world, everyone's trying to answer that question, right? And eventually they allow them to get married. Now the next question is, should they adopt children? It's like, what, I mean, you, <laughs> you're wasting your time answering those kinds of questions. The point is, they were all wrong. Chris Wrong was wrong, Will Smith was wrong, everybody was wrong, they shouldn't have been there. What was he expecting when he's entertaining Hollywood people? What was he expecting? He's lucky he only got a slap. <laughs> right? So the point is they're all wrong. Nobody was right. You shouldn't be there, you shouldn't even be watching it. That's the point. But now it's now has gained fame. And we're wasting our time. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. So you're trying to answer a foolish question. The Bible says this, even about not foolish questions, just natural things. It says, and further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. See, I can make a book about this, make a book about that, a book about, you know, you just want to learn everything, you want to find out everything. Is that what God has called us to do? That's not what God has called us to do. It's only what you need to accomplish the Great Commission. Yes, you need to go to work so that you can, you know, uh, keep your family because he that, should not, he that does not work should not eat. So you need to survive. You need to take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Be responsible for that. Yes, you need to go to work. So it's still helping you so that you can have time for your family. Have time for God. To serve God. So everything you need for the Great Commission is what you should be focused on. That's why the Bible goes on to say in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment of every, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. God is going to bring everything into judgment. It will be tried by fire. And what would, what would stand is the question. So, and this is for believers. Now for unbelievers, yeah. They'll be, they'll be judged. Books will be open and they'll be judged by their works if they don't, since they don't want to believe. And we'll see if they'll make it. So, we are not called to know everything. We should perform our roles in the body of Christ. What, oh, every, uh, the eye cannot say, or oh, the eyes and the head, but the hand cannot say, oh yeah, I'm part of the leg, or, or I should do the work of the leg. No, just do your role in the body of Christ for the edification of the whole body. So, now let me go further and say this. Not all questions from a fool are foolish questions. Say that again. Not all questions from a fool are foolish questions. Yes, I know that. Proverbs is not a contradiction in the Bible because the Bible says in Proverbs 26, verse 4, I'll just read that. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Lest thou also be like unto him, 
answer a fool, verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So there are some questions that a fool will ask that you need to answer. Because the Bible says just avoid foolish questions. But there are some questions that a fool will ask that you need to answer. So you have to be wise enough to judge when to answer those questions. Now, that's why after the first and the second admonition, reject. Right? And also, not all questions from a wise man are wise questions. <laughs> so just as a fool might ask a question that you need to address, although it's in his folly and in his conceit is asking it, you need to address it, but he might not want to see reason to it. Um, just reject after that. Um, so don't spend all day trying to prove the delusion of the Big Bang Theory. That's what I'm trying to say. You're at the door, you know, he's asking a question. Oh, but what how about this? You know, admonish the first time, admonish the second time, but don't spend all day when you're so winning or when you're talking privately with anyone. Uh, know when to leave the door, know when to leave that conversation or change the conversation. So understand this, you're not condemning the person. The person is already condemned, right? That's number one. And you're trying to help the person. The person is condemning himself, as the Bible says. Because you feel bad, oh, I have to get to the bottom of it. No, you're not. If you leave that door, it doesn't mean, oh, yes, I'm sending you to hell. You're trying to pull him out of the fire, as the Bible says. All right. There are three examples of foolish questions that I wanted to talk about also. Um, the first one. Let's look at uh, John 18. Open to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. So at first I looked at three, uh, three areas in the Bible addressing foolish questions, uh, um, including 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 23. So now I just want to look at an example of a foolish question. So three of them. And this is the famous Pilate question. In case you don't know it, I'll just read it for you. John 18 verse 33, the Bible says, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, uh, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? So what is Jesus trying to do here? Basically, Jesus is asking Pilate this question. Do you believe it? Art thou the king of the Jews? Do you believe it? Are you saying this of yourself, or did others tell it Tell it, uh, it thee of me. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Sorry, I'm reading now, verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, and I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. What is Jesus trying to do here? Jesus trying to say, I am a king. But guess what? I'm more than the king of the Jews. So when you hear that I am more than the king of the Jews, your question, it should be a, a wiser question, right? I mean, you should start asking the right things. So that's what Jesus is expecting, to ask the right questions. Pilate therefore said unto him, verse 37, Are thou a king then? I mean, you just said my kingdom. <laughs> so Pilate is going the wrong route. He's not asking a wise question. So are thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest, I am a king. That's the way, the olden ways of saying yes. Right. Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You know, this is like the last chance for Pilate. You know, he's just trying, okay, yes, I'm a king, if that's what you wanted. And I came to bear witness to the truth. And if you hear the truth, you will hear my voice. So, what does Pilate say? Verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? <laughs> I mean, at this point, just like, okay, yes. Every time I read this, in fact, the first time I, I found out about this was when I was a little child, I was watching Jesus of Nazareth, and that, that scenario, uh, scene, I should say, can never leave my head. I mean, it's like, what is truth? <laughs> What do you mean, what is truth? Anyway, let me finish with it. And Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and, and saith unto them, I find, no, find in him no fault at all. So what is truth? It sounds so philosophical, right? What is truth? It's something that it could be a whole subject in a class in college, right? You waste your whole time finding out what is truth. It, you know, and 
so, so when I hear it now, I'm thinking this in my head, you know, like people high, you know, like they are smoking and they're high and the guy's like, what is truth, man? What is truth? And the guy passes the ball, right? And he's like, oh, let's take it back. What is what, man? What is what? It's like, what? The <laughs> it's like, they want to go back and, you know, what is is, man? What is is? Like, it's, it's so dumb. <laughs> what is truth? See, Pilate was so trapped in darkness that he could not see the light right there in front of him. And we're laughing at Pilate, but I'm going to bring this home real quick. The world blinds many people. I mean, the world, people are blinded in this world because of all the deceitfulness of riches and all the things in this life. And people get so caught up with the deception of this world that they cannot see the lie that they are living. It's a lie. Oh, they believe that, oh, they'll do all the good works and then they'll go to heaven. Like, that they'll be perfect. And anytime you ask them, every time they come to church, every time they come before God, they've sinned. But they still believe that, oh, I'll go to heaven because I'm a good person. But every time you ask them, are you, are you a sinner? Have you sinned? Oh, yeah, I've sinned. That's at least the sensible ones. We say, yes, I've sinned. Some will say, I've not sinned in months. <laughs> Those ones, I don't know what to do with them. But the sensible ones say, oh, yeah, I've sinned. But you believe that your good works will take you to heaven. Like, they, they are living in such a lie and they are blinded by it. And they don't even understand what truth is. So that's why the Bible says it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Because he believes in himself so much. Oh, his hard work. Um to get good things. So deceived by riches. And the riches of this world is not a fulfillment of life. Now, Pilate did not ask, at least according to the Bible, what is the truth? He asked, what is truth? That's where the problem is. You know, if I said, what is the truth? That means he knows what truth is. He's just finding out, okay, so what is, what are you saying? Like, tell me something. No, but he's just asking, what is truth? Like, just like philosophical so what is truth what does that mean truth has lost its meaning in the world that in this world back then and even now truth has lost its meaning now truth is what is accepted so jesus is telling him oh i'm here to uh, uh, witness the truth what he say again i'm here to bear witness unto the truth everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice and Pilate is like okay so when you say of the truth hear my voice so what is truth it's how somebody is going to ask is it man's truth? Is it the truth of the society? Or is it Caesar's truth? That means the government truth. What do I mean by man's truth? You know, every, the world will say, oh, yo, this is my truth. Right? This is my truth. My truth is that I do this or I do that. My truth is that, that. So everyone has their own truth. Then the society, what is politically correct? What is accepted by everyone? Okay, this is societal truth. Right? Then you have propaganda. What the government tells you is true. You know, that building five or building seven just collapsed because the wind of the plane collapsed it. You know, that is truth. You gotta accept it. If you say something else. So Pilate, understanding all this, he's like, so what is truth? Do you see that? People are so lost. They don't know what truth is anymore. And you show them, to them it's like, okay, this is, they've, they've lost the concept of what truth is. You know, I, I stand for facts over truth. Or what do you even say? Facts over, is that what I said? So they don't understand what truth is. Pilate, the governor, and the president, they don't know what truth is. It, you love a pilot back then, but it's happening right now. That's the same person that's leading us. They don't know what truth is. It's no more a fact. It's no more a fact for people. Let's look at another example. So that was a foolish question. And what did Jesus do? Stop talking. That was it. He ain't talking anymore. Um, number two, what is eternal life? Open to John chapter 17. I, I'm, I'm asking this question, or I'm saying this is a foolish question. I'll explain. Because I remember after I got saved, this question was asked to me. After I got saved earlier on, I was teaching uh, the truth about the gospel. I, was, I taught eternal life. There was this young man in the church at the time. And he, he came and he challenged me. He asked me, what is eternal life? This is after I finished explaining everything. So I've explained what it is. So to me, it was baffling. Like, what do you mean, what is eternal life? I mean, it's two words, eternal and life. You know, in Romans 6.23, it's the opposite of death there. It means you're not going to go to hell forever, eternally. Right? So you're going to be with Christ. You're not going to go to hell. You're not going to experience death. That is what eternal life is. Then he told me, open to John 17. It's like, okay. I mean, hey, yeah, let's go. Let's open John 17. And we start reading from verse 1. 
These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all fish, that he should, I say fish, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He said, you see, the Bible defines eternal life. To know God and to know Jesus. I'm like, what? <laughs> so after all I have said, <laughs> eternal life is just, oh, if you know God and if you know Jesus, then you have eternal life. I, 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 was, I was weak. I'll tell you the truth. I was like, what else do you want to say to this person? Right? So according to him, knowing God, knowing Jesus, it's not about being saved from hell. So he's like, we all have eternal life. You know, we all, do you know God? Yes. Do you know Jesus? Yes. You have eternal life. Because the Bible says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather... And known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. So, we getting saved is by Jesus knowing us and not us knowing Jesus. So, that's something he didn't understand. So, it's by Jesus knowing us. Because, oh, when you did not know God, you were worshipping idols and all those things. You know, doing works of the flesh. Uh, or I should say, dead works, doing dead works, not good works. But now that you have known God, rather, are known of God. That means God knows you. So he's almost correcting himself intentionally to point out the fact that the fact that um, uh, God knows you means you are saved. And this is Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 there. So, uh, how turn you again to all those weakly, uh, weak and beggarly elements? So to be known of God is salvation. And that's why Jesus in Matthew 7 said, I never knew you. Right? So they'll say, oh, but we did all these works for you. We did wonderful works and all of that. Just say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. For I never knew you. So it's when Jesus knows you that you're saved. Now, he conveniently ignores the other clear verses that I showed him about what eternal life is. All the explanation. In John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Oh, no, that, that is not eternal life. That is not everlasting life. Oh, John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Oh, but no, 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 it's just knowing Jesus that. So everybody in, everybody that saw Jesus, that knew him, <laughs> had eternal life. You know? And they can keep going on and on into this. It was a long discussion. You know, I was, then I was younger, so I was trying to, younger in the Lord, I should say. So I was trying, even younger actually. So I was trying to um, get people say, get him saved as much as I could. And it was a long discussion, just what is eternal life? Something that, you know, is just very clear to explain. So, what's, what's he tripping on here? He's tripping on the prayer that Jesus was praying to God. Jesus was not explaining to his disciples. He was just praying to God openly in front of them. So, it's Jesus and God talking. And he's using that with his misunderstanding to apply, oh, eternal life is just knowing, knowing the Lord. It's just like when the Bible says, anyone that says Jesus... Uh, Jesus is God and he came from God is the son of God then he has the Holy Spirit in him there are many people that say that don't have the Holy Spirit in him <laughs> so it's because they don't believe it they don't understand what the Messiah is they are talking without understanding without wisdom so uh, in 1 Corinthians open to 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 35 because this is not new this is not new. Even in the Bible, this is what Paul went through. You say, oh, what I went through, person asking me, what is eternal life? How will people, you know, rise again from the dead? All of that. Paul went through the same thing, the same thing, because nothing is new under the sun. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? You see, Paul went on to answer this question. So, how do you mean they'll have eternal life? So, once they die, they'll come back again. You know, what does that mean? 
So how are the dead raised up? It is spiritual, right? Eternal life is spiritual. Uh, it, cannot be, it, it can be understood by natural things, which is what Paul proved there, if you read the whole passage, because of time, I won't go into it. You sow a seed, and it's a different thing from the, of the seed that comes up. It's a new body. It first dies, and it come, a, a new body comes out. So it is not rocket science, but they want to trip you up. So they ask you these kind of questions. So the first one is, what is truth? Second one is, what is eternal life? Now, the third one and the last one is, can God create a heavy stone that he cannot lift? So, <laughs> you know, this kind of question and all similar questions in this category are skeptical questions. It's from the skeptical, those that don't believe, you know. So it's kind of like they are gotcha question. I got you. So you say God is uh, uh, omnip omnipotent. He's so, he can do anything. He's so powerful. Can he create a stone that he cannot lift? You know, they make up all these <laughs> stupid questions. So, the point here is that they are trying to fit God in their own limitations. Remember, they, they are subverted and they are condemning their own selves. And God says, avoid these questions, avoid foolish questions. So, they have imagined another God. So, they made up a God in their head and they are like, oh, the God you are saying cannot be a real God. Because if you are saying he's all this, can he do this? So, they are comparing their own God with a God that they've made up in their own head. And God cannot be less than he is just to conform to their own God. So God always gets the glory. And if he's, if he's not getting the glory, then forget about it. Like he's not, everything he does, everything God does, whether it's good to us, evil to us, like Job, it's for the glory of God and for the furtherance of the gospel. All right, let's conclude. Now, back to Adam's belly button. So, did Adam have a belly button? Here's my take. Now, if your interest has been piqued about my take, that is the whole point of this sermon. <laughs> the fact that you're still interested to hear my answer to Adam's belly button is the very reason that we are warned about foolish questions. I'm not going to answer that question because it's a foolish question. Did Adam have a belly button? The flesh eats this stuff up, wanting to argue over vain and unprofitable things. What does the Bible say in our Bible reading? Look at verse 14 there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Of these things puts them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Do you see that? So it's just going to increase more, unto more ungodliness. So you shun all those things. Don't, don't, don't excite the flesh, because it's not the spirit trying to find out, oh, did Adam have a belly button? It's the flesh. And that will lead to other things. It's just lead to more ungodliness. So, um, we should uh, not argue over vain and unprofitable things just to learn and just to keep learning and learning and learning. There are, there are people that do that and never come to the knowledge of the truth. As the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, this happens in the last days, perilous times. The Bible says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly, and, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Oh, you just want to learn. You want to learn this new thing or that new thing. You just packing up knowledge so you can write books and books and books. It's just a weariness of the flesh. So it might start out as clean fun, right? Oh, just having fun. Just want to find out what's your take. Yeah, I don't have a belly button. You know, it might start out as clean fun, but they will generate strife between brethren. So don't dwell on foolish questions. Let's bow our heads.